did you want to talk about autism and, and vaccines? Because I know you mentioned it a while ago. We kind of got way yes. way away from it, and then I know you wanted to. Yeah, ask I would about love it. to. Yeah, well, vaccines. I mean, these are, it's a it's a hot button topic, um, which I don't think it should be. I think we should be able to have these kinds of conversations. But yeah, I mean, there's a lot of you know perhaps misconceptions about them. Um, I'm certainly not like an anti-vaxxer in any in any sense, but um, but you know there there are people. Everything today has become so polarized, you know. Mm-hmm. So, what's your take as an integrative pediatrician? Yeah, when it comes to vaccines, it seems to be the most controversial topic that there is, and I don't know why we've gotten here. I mean, there there should be no topic that's off limits. We need to be able to talk about it. And the only way that we're going to get to a better place where people are informed and can trust anything is if we have discussions. And there's nothing more frustrating than that topic because as soon as you bring up anything, it devolves into an argument. Either it's because of the vaccines, you know, that this this issue happened or, you know, I can't believe you're talking about it. It's an anti-vaxxer thing. And I'm not pro or anti anything. You know, I don't think that makes any sense. I'm pro health pro children, pro having discussions and figuring out what makes the most sense for your family and your child. And unless we're able to have conversations about everything, we're never going to get to a better place. And there has never been a greater distrust in medicine at this point. I mean, any of the research that shows um, where the trust is in the healthcare system has just plummeted off the edge over the last few years because I think people are not getting the information that they need and so they feel like if i'm not hearing information I'm not hearing discussions if i'm just being told what to do well what are they hiding from me what are they not telling me and and i think if there were more open and honest discussions we'd be in a in a much better place and and you know i'm not again i'm not against anything i just think that we should have conversations around it and i'm trying to talk about it a little bit more because i think we need to if we want people to be comfortable doing anything if we want the best possible outcomes for our kids then we shouldn't trust a pharmaceutical company. We should trust research and science and uh, doctors and, and everybody to come together to do what's best for our kids. And if we don't discuss it, then how do we know if we can make it better? How do we know if we can make it safer? How do we know if, if there are things that we could do to help our kids to get to a better place as opposed to saying, no, everything's perfect. Well, nothing in medicine is ever perfect. Everything has side effects and everything can be made better. Hmm. I, I really appreciate that. Do you think there's value in delaying the, the schedule? So, you know, when it comes to the schedule as a doctor, the only thing that you can really recommend is the CDC, American Academy schedule, because that's the only thing that's been studied. But I feel like, again, this is one of those things where we should have more discussions on it. We should talk about it. We should get more research to decide if there are better ways or different ways to do things for kids. You know, I take care of uh, all kinds of patients. And, and so some people do delayed schedules, some people do the regular schedule, all people do all sorts of different things, but is it better or worse? I, I don't know. There, like that, the, there's no answer to that question because there's no research on it that mm. I know of. Interesting. So how is then a parent, like where does a parent even begin to do that kind of research? Like it, It's very hard because you know people ask me that those questions and in the office it's really just discussions. There are some books out there, but most things are very one-sided. I mean, you have obviously You can go see the CDC and American Academy information so you can get the advice that's been recommended by those societies, which I think is very valuable and you need to take that into account most certainly. Um, But then anything else is going to be very much on the other side. And so it's really hard when you're in the middle, which I think are most people. Most people are in the middle somewhere where they want to do what's best for their children's health and they are just not sure what that is anymore. And they have questions which you should have as a parent you should have questions about everything you do certainly if you're going to give your child 30 40 50 of something you should have questions about that there's nothing wrong with that Um, and and we should be able to have discussions to encourage people to do whatever we feel is best for them Hmm. and and intelligent people can disagree on what's the best thing to do for a child in terms of their long-term health but everybody has the same goal right which is healthy children and if that's what we want, then we should have discussions, not get angry at somebody who has a different opinion and debate it and debate it and discuss it. And if there aren't answers to certain questions, try to figure those answers out. And if we just trust research and data that a company has done for six months, two weeks, two years, we don't have data anything long term. And then there are a lot of people that are concerned about long term complications. From, from medicine in general, and we don't have the research on it because who's doing it? 
So how do we know? How can you say that we do or do not have uh, eczema as a long-term complication from a medication? Or, you know, you talked about, um, you know, the like Ozempic and things like that. It's like, well, well, what if it causes serious cancer in 20 years? You know, how do we know? You can't say that it doesn't unless you do that kind of research. So you can only give information based on the best information that we have, which which is fine as long as you're open and honest with it. But I don't think that we're open and honest with these things. I think it's more like, oh, just just do things, just do it. And that's not okay. I mean, I think we need to have discussions to encourage people and discuss it and help them decide what's best for them as opposed to telling people what to do. Yeah, and medicine so rarely addresses where as an establishment, it's been wrong. You know, mm-hmm. we've seen that over the past certainly four years, um, and so I think it's I think it's really important to to have these conversations. Do you have rates of autism been have they increased? Have is it just that we've gotten better at diagnosing it? From my vantage point, it seems like there we're seeing a lot higher rates. Yes. Yeah, so my opinion, based on the research, is that it is much higher than it ever used to be. If you go back. Many decades ago, it was like one in 25,000. Then it dropped down to one in 150 uh, a couple decades ago, and then one in 40. Then the last I saw was one in 36, but one in 22 in California. And one in 22,000 or one, one in 22? One in 22. Two children, yes, in California. One in 36 overall. So that's where we are now. Um, and to me, it doesn't make any sense that it would be just based on the fact that we're better at diagnosis. Absolutely, we are. So there's no question that that's a part of it. But we did not go from one in I don't know thousand to one in twenty two over a couple of decades just because we're better at diagnosis. Especially when you consider that twenty to thirty percent of children with autism are nonverbal. Where is that twenty to thirty percent of kids fifty years ago? Like they would maybe have a different diagnosis, but they would still be there. Uh, so I, I think it's just happening more. Um, and I think, it, again, it's another very frustrating topic because when you say that, it, again, causes a lot of controversy. People get really upset about it. But if we don't describe the problem and we're not honest about it, then we're never going to do anything to fix it because it's like, oh, it's just normal. It's just happening. As opposed to this is happening. It's getting worse. There is more and more severe issues. There are a lot of kids that are having significant difficulties and a lot of families that are having significant difficulties. What can we do to help those families? And there are things that can be done some of the time for sure because I've seen it. I've seen it myself. I've seen it in the research. I've seen kids lose their diagnosis. I mean, it it is possible for sure sometimes. I'm sure you've seen the uh, recent headlines. There was a, uh, it was a case report of of twins and Mm -hmm. one of the twins was put on a, minimally processed, gluten-free diet. I forget if there were other interventions, but Mm -hmm. at least in terms of this case report, they reported a dramatic reversal, Mm quote-unquote reversal of symptoms. Yeah, so that was documenting hope. I'm actually an advisor with them. I was not part of the study, but I'm a part of that that community. And it's a really interesting study. They took two 20-month-olds, and they had pretty severe autism. And over three years... At 20 months, can you already see that? You can see it. So the, I mean, it's usually like questionnaires and the practitioners will do assessments to, to assume. And, and I mean, they were pretty high on the autism scores based on the checklist that they use. So presumably, yes, I mean, you're having communication issues, repetitive behaviors, gut issues. So there are, there are things that they can certainly, you can either get the diagnosis or have a presumptive diagnosis that, you know, potentially expresses itself later. But they they basically did the whole gambit of things. They did all sorts of studies. They change up their diet. They change up their lifestyle. They work with functional integrative practitioners. And over three years, they went from very high scores to almost non-existent scores. I think it was like 70 to 30 or 40, and it was like 40 to four, like, you know, those scores, which uh, I'm not an autism. Uh, I don't do the diagnoses, but I mean, it's a pretty significant difference over that short a time. And again, that gets back to the fact that there are things that we can do sometimes. And, and a lot of the discussion tends to be around genetics. And of course, genetics plays a factor. But when you see studies like that, when you see kids like that, it's really unfortunate and frustrating that that's not the discussion that parents are hearing. Because if they heard that, then maybe they would make some changes in their life. And maybe they would help their kids to get to a better place. But if you're just told this is normal, this is how it is, then you're not going to change up your diet. You're not going to do things differently. And it's not about blaming or shaming. Again, I think that's where we're we're running into issues is that if 
we say that it's a lifestyle disease, that means that you did something in theory, that a parent did something, that there's something we could have done differently, that something caused this as opposed to it just being genetics. And that's not the right angle to take. Nobody's blaming anybody. We need to learn about what's going on so that way we can prevent it from happening in the future and help these kids as much as possible. And with everything in parenting and everything in life, we learn as we're moving forward and we do better based on knowing better. And if there's anything that we can do to make children healthier and happier, why wouldn't we do that? Why would we run in the other direction? There's just no reason to do that in my mind. I mean, we're all on the same team. Absolutely. There was another study um, that came out very recently. It found that I think um, parents that were uh, had a more, the more closely parents could have been just the mother, I'm not sure, I don't remember, but had it, it adhered to a Mediterranean style dietary pattern, mm-hmm. there was a, it was a dramatically reduced risk of having offspring that had autism. And there's mm-hmm. obviously, there could be healthy user bias there. Somebody who's, you know, more closely adhering to a Mediterranean dietary pattern, probably more likely to exercise, take a multivitamin, for example. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if we can, you know, tease out the specific variable that may have been causally related to that, to that um, effect. However, when I posted it, when I shared about it, I was shocked at the pushback that mm-hmm. I had gotten from parents. Like the the some some of the uh, replies that I got in my DMs were actually quite vitriolic. How could you su- possibly suggest that this is, mm-hmm. you know? Oh yeah, I'm used to it. <laughs> uh, a, a, a lifestyle mediated condition. Mm-hmm. Well, I I think some of that comes from the fact that there are a lot of adults that have got the diagnosis later in life, and so then they're kind of within that world of autism trying to push back and say that it's it's just something that is they don't want it to be a, a lifestyle disease but i think the issue is that even just by that nature the adults that are getting that diagnosis discussing sending you the mean messages those are not the same thing as the kids that are uh, unable to, to to talk unable to function that are mm. hurting themselves like th- it's a very different population and i think that you almost have to separate it a little bit because some kids with autism have, are absolutely brilliant like they're savants they're even much so there's a wide range of what it means and autism is not a genetic diagnosis in terms of like we take this test and we know you have autism i think there's a lot of genetics involved but we're not there yet and, and i think autism is probably many many things it's probably caused by a variety of different chemicals toxins lifestyle factors that it's probably 10 20 50 different things and we call it autism because they have similar symptoms or, or maybe the the chemicals and toxins are creating a syndrome that we call autism. But I think we almost have to break it apart at this point into multiple well, so different true. things. Yeah, what you're saying is it's not a monolith. And while mm-hmm. some people may be extremely high functioning and have owned and are proud of their their, their diagnosis, um, there are some who are nonverbal. And, right. You know, and, and, and supporting and, and loving and discussing one group doesn't negate the other group. I mean, they're both probably true. and. When you look at diabetes, you have type one and type two, and especially with type two, if you change up your lifestyle, we know, and that's like pretty common knowledge in medicine, like, oh, you know, exercise more, eat healthier, you lose your diagnosis. That's probably true of almost every condition at this point, all the autoimmune conditions, autism. I mean, I think we need to start thinking about type one and type two of everything. And I think that might be helpful for parents because I do think for autism, yeah, there's probably some kids that it's completely genetic, or mostly genetic, and no matter what we do, they're still gonna have the condition. Maybe you can still help their functioning, but you're not gonna get rid of the diagnosis. But there's probably a huge subsection of children that it's completely lifestyle. And if we support them and help them to change their lifestyle, they're going to lose their diagnosis. That is my guess, based on what I'm seeing, and based on the fact that kids do get better and do have a huge shift in their symptoms to the point where they lose their diagnosis. I've seen that happen in my own office, and I work with many practitioners that say the same thing. So you can't say that it's all genetic when that happens. Hey, if you liked that video, you need to check out this one here, and I'll see you there.